والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم الله أكبر So that was the conduct of the Prophet ﷺ. He had both sides. How many of us actually know that, you know, to, to create laughter sometimes is a sunnah? Because normally when we see pious people, they look very serious. And yes, they are pious. They are pious. But sometimes we don't get this type of speech from them because they are concerned that if we have to say this, being people who everyone looks up to, then people might not understand. And for that reason, it's not mentioned normally. But today we are sitting here. I am a brother of yours, probably younger than the majority who are here. And I'm sharing this with you because it is serious. Now the world is changing. Many people are saying the Muslims are boring, especially when it comes to marriage. Some girls want to marry outside and some boys want to marry outside. And they say, no, the Muslims are boring. They have no idea of what life is all about. They want to sit and so on. That is not true. Last night I made mention of some of the the romance that occurred between the Prophet peace be upon him and his wife and I use the word romance because I have come across a book which says the best story the best love story that history has known someone might think Romeo and Juliet and this and no ways nowhere near it is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Aisha radiallahu anha and how he treated her but we don't know it. Nobody's discussed it. Nobody's tried to look for it. Nobody's bothered. We'd rather go for counseling, marriage counseling to people who know nothing about Islam. And they teach us things. And at the same time, we'll take it because they taught it to us. Let me go to one other point. I spoke about how the Prophet spoke. That is a very important point because we speak every single day. How he spoke. Before I get to the second issue, let me complete regarding the speech. I was saying he spoke only when it was necessary. That does not mean if someone asks you, how are you brother? Then you think to yourself, that's not necessary. And you just look at him and, and you just nod your head. No, it is an act of worship to respond in a nice way. But you don't have to say, no, I am fine. I went there and you know, I came and you know, yesterday and I'm planning to go to London next week. And I'm planning to uh, really, I want to make Umrah and Hajj next year. And you know, we're planning to have children as a, fa as, as, as a family. <laughs> now, all that is unnecessary information. One narration says, Ista'inu ala qada'i hawa'ijikum bil kitmani. According to one narration, the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, seek assistance to fulfill your needs by being secretive about it. So you don't have to inform anyone anything. You have a big business project, don't tell anyone, nobody. The hadith says, if you want it to succeed, keep it a secret. When it is done, everybody can see it's there. Because Elements are jealous sometimes and news might travel and they might block you. So the Prophet is telling you be secretive. How many of us knew that? So many times people say, people say, look, we want to do this, we want to do that, but don't tell anyone. But they don't realize it's a sunnah not to tell anyone. It's a sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, not to tell anyone. Why? You must be secretive about those matters that maybe when people hear about them, they might not take it correctly. Also, if you just tell a closed circle, the news you might tell only genuine people, but the news might innocently seep and leak to those who are not innocent. Then you've got a problem. Then you are unable to fulfill such a big issue and such a big matter solely because the news leaked. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about because it's common in everybody's life. Sometimes you want to get married. You don't have to let every single person know six months in advance. I'm interested in that girl, for example. No, let it come. When the invite goes out, people will say, oh, the two are getting married. Because I tell you, if someone else was interested in the same girl, you've had it. <laughs> you've had it. You know, I'm a counselor and I tell you how people can be so low and they can plan the downfall of an innocent person solely because they are not happy with who the person is about to get married to or for whatever reasons. May Allah protect us all. That is the devil. It's not us, it's the Satan. And we need to protect ourselves from Satan. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not speak when it was unnecessary that that means that he answered the questions he was asked he said what he had to and so on but he did not release too much information and he did not get too friendly with those whom he didn't know for example but he was extremely polite
Do you know what the hadith says? How polite he was. It says, لا يحسب أو لا يحسب Either one of them. لا يحسب جليسه أن أحدا أكرم عليه منه سبحان الله Everyone who was seated in front of him thought that he was the most loved to the Prophet. That's the type of character he had. So every single person who sat in front of him thought that, no, I'm closest to this man. No one is closer than me to him. Every one of them thought that. Look at how complete his character was. Today we stand here, we might know two people, five people. The way we put our face, the others want to run away from us. Allahu Akbar. Obviously we are not prophets. But the bare minimum is let our family members think that we are the best. That's the bare minimum. And I'm stressing on this because it is a global problem. The rate of divorce is scary. It's a sign of Qiyamah, but it is scary. And I'm quite sure it must be also in this part of the world because you are still in the world. You know, you are not outside the world. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, when it came to his speech, he spoke well. And we've learned a few pointers about the speech of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let me get to something that we all do all the time. Every single moment of the day and night we are doing it. What is it? Breathing. Have we ever looked at how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam breathed? People want to go to yoga and Reiki and what have you, art of living and art of dying, to learn how to breathe and they come and tell you no I need to know how to breathe what an insult to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself have you ever gone into how he breathed they probably got it from here there were times when he took deep breaths and let me inform you he's, he did not breathe with his stomach he breathed with his lungs that is a point most of us are guilty of breathing with our stomachs when you breathe, our, your stomach moves. When we breathe, our stomachs move. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he breathed, his chest moved. Allahu Akbar, think of it very carefully. That is a sunnah. Amazing. If you try it without moving your stomach, it's difficult even for me, believe me. Because since we were born, we've been doing that. No one taught us how to breathe. But here we have a sunnah. My role model is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I'm sure he is yours as well. But now we need to, it is high time we educated ourselves about certain issues and elements so that we don't need to engage in the shirk and whatever it is when it comes to art of living and yoga. Back in South Africa and Zimbabwe, the ulama have issued a unanimous decree to say it is totally forbidden and haram to engage in any form of yoga, reiki or art of living. That is our decision there. I don't know about what your ulama have said here because we have found that it is actually Hinduism, nothing more than that. And there is a way of getting to the Muslimin in a very subtle manner, getting back at the Muslims. May Allah protect us all. However, we need to learn how to breathe. But we need to learn from the correct source because breathing is very important. The Prophet ﷺ used to take deep breaths such that his belly was in, not out. And his lungs moved. You try and put your stomach right in as far as you can. Early morning, you breathe the fresh air. And this is why Salatul Fajr, the hadith says, بَشِّرِ الْمَشَّائِينَ فِي الظُّلَمِ إِلَى الْمَسَاجِدِ بِالنُّورِ التَّامِّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Give good news. Listen carefully. Eh? Give good news to those who walk to the masjids in the dark hours of the night. That they will be having a complete nur and light on the day of judgment. They will be recognized. Now in Islam, we hear the hadith, I'm sure many of us may have heard it, but we don't realize what impact it has on our health. When you walk early morning to the masjid, I have been getting up and standing outside for my lift, coming for Fajr the last few days, and I notice so many people, from the look of it, because they are wearing short and so on, they may not be Muslim, but they are walking. And I think to myself, here is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa telling us, take a brisk walk, to the masjid every morning subhanallah take a brisk walk to the masjid what would happen automatically not 50 years later when the doctor tells you you know your cholesterol is high you are dying unless you walk then you start walking no the doctor tells you to walk you walk but the prophet tells you to walk you don't want to walk allahu akbar where are we and where is the deen and where is our conduct 
So, when you walk at that hour, what air are you breathing? You are breathing fresh air. Fresh air. Sometimes the doctors will tell you, open the window and breathe the air from outside. Early morning. Then we will open the window religiously. Put our clock and open the window. But when we are told, just walk outside so your whole body is out. Then we don't want to walk. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding of the beauty of this religion. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he breathed, he had several techniques, not only one. Not only one technique, he had several techniques. And inshallah, very soon, there will be some booklets released on these topics that I'm talking about. There are certain scholars that I have spoken to, to dig up these ahadith, which are not all found in the six correct books, meaning there are six books which are more commonly known. There are so many other books of hadith, which have mentioned these smaller points. Up to now, a lot of people thought, you know what, we need to concentrate on more important issues. I think that now everything is important. And it is time for us to know this so that we know what Islam has offered us. Let me give you another example. How to walk? Now you find people taking a brisk walk. Islam has given so much importance to walking that the, the different types of walking are recognized by one word. One word. When we go for Umrah, the, the hadith only says that you need to do Ramal. Ramal, that's the word. One word. Ra, Meem, Lam, Ramal. We don't know what is Ramal. We need to hear from the ulama. What is the meaning of Ramal? They will sit in it. They will <laughs> the ulama will sit and explain to you, and it will take them a few minutes to tell you that Ramal is a quick, brisk walk, sticking your chest out in a certain manner with shorter steps but you need to walk not a run not a trot but it's a very fast walk you know when they have walking competitions people want to contest walking see how they walk okay that is a little bit too far-fetched according to me meaning that is something that when they are walking in that manner yes it might benefit them but the look of it does not look like you know the haiba of it is more let's leave that only for racing okay that's the best way of putting it but when it comes to Ramal, it's what happens around the Kaaba, the first three rounds. Try that walk, subhanallah, early morning. Not from the doctor, from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Then the Prophet ﷺ, when he walked, he looked down and walked. And every time he walked, it was as though he was coming down a hill, even though he might have been climbing a hill. That was a miracle. Can I tell you one more miracle, since we are talking about the walking of the Prophet ﷺ? One miracle of his was the earth underneath him knew that the most beloved of the creatures of Allah is walking on top of me. So the earth used to crumple, subhanAllah. So when he walked, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he covered more ground than those who walked around him, though they were using the same pace. And the Sahaba make mention of this so many times. They say, we tried to keep up with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if we ran, we went ahead of him. And if we walked, we were behind him. So it was quite difficult because the earth used to crumple to make it easy for him to reach a distance. Subhanallah. That was a miracle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you take a look at the description of the Quran of walking, one word is used, hawnan. وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا the true worshippers of Allah, when they walk on earth, they walk hawnan. What is the meaning of hawnan? Neither too fast, nor too slow. Neither stamping their feet, nor tiptoeing. But a very respectful walk, subhanallah, full of humility and humbleness. Allah says, وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا In Surah Luqman. Do not walk on earth with arrogance. Some people, tend to walk with their noses far up and they look at others with the corners of their eyes thinking that this street belongs to me and my father <laughs> and thinking that I am now breathing the air one inch above everybody else it's more fresh Allahu Akbar if that is the attitude Wallahi our character and conduct is in the dustbin it is in the dustbin we need to ask Allah to protect us when we walk it says a lot about us Someone was telling me today that you are very quick in picking up things. And I thought to myself that it is only the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that makes us pick up people very quick. Very, very fast. 
Why? Because you know that now this person here, just from the way they walk, from their attitude, and believe me, Sri Lanka is one of the best countries in the world. From where I have visited, I was telling someone today, and I'm not lying to you, I actually told the Maulana, he can confirm it, that you know, more than the place, I love the people. Inshallah. May Allah grant us all mahabba and love. And may Allah keep us all sincere and good character and conduct. I have been to places where they look at you. Even if you joke, they, it's like they're telling you, tickle me, I want to laugh. <laughs> So, the Prophet wasallam really, when we take a look at his walking, it is described, if Allah says the true worshippers, they walk in this manner, he was the truest of worshippers. So definitely he walked hawnan. And Allah says, وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا Allahu Akbar. That is another point regarding speech. Allah says, when the ignorant address the true worshippers, they just say peace and they walk away. They don't engage in discussion. Someone comes to you in public and starts shouting and screaming and so on. If you are going to confront them in public, people will think you started the problem. When the police come, you will be arrested. You will be arrested. May Allah protect us. Rather, when someone is showing ignorance, greet him, smile at him and walk away. We have what is known as road rage in our part of the world. Especially in South Africa, road rage. You have highways where people are flying. So if someone is blocking you, for example, they get so angry in South Africa, they take a gun out and they point it and say, Hey, Wallahi, that is a fact. That's what happens. Road rage. Now the Muslims, what are we taught? Someone is hooting and popping and getting very angry with you. Look at him with a broad smile and nod your head. He will feel like a fool. <laughs> that is what you are taught. What more can you offer him besides a smile? Let's be honest. You can't communicate with that man. You are in a fix, for example. Like sometimes what happens is, people dial and because of the network, there is a cross line, they phone the wrong number. So when you tell them wrong number, they swear you, you wasted my money. You did. No one wasted your money. I am an innocent person, I answered the phone. How am I meant to know before I answered the phone that it's a wrong number? Otherwise, I wouldn't have wasted your money. You know, maybe we need to find a gadget which tells us wrong number. So, the reality is we need to learn how to react to every incident that occurs that is part and parcel of our character and conduct, the social conduct of a Muslim. Sometimes as a school teacher, you have parents who come and react in a wrong way. You need to know how to deal with that professionally. That's Islam. Don't make a matter worse. Ask yourself, do I want to solve the problem or make it worse? If you want to make it worse, you start swearing as well. Sometimes we find Muslims saying, I will show them who I am. Who do they think they are? I will show them I'm a man. I will send their coffins going that side. These are statements we hear in anger. Is that a Muslim? If the Prophet ﷺ was there, would we ever have said those words? Allahu Akbar. And Allah is always watchful over us. We should know that completely. And He is taking a complete record of everything we are doing. Don't we feel shy of our own Creator? Rabbul Izzati wal Jalal, the Omnipotent, Allahu Akbar. So, how to react to an incident? Like sometimes, and we have this problem even in the schools back at home, where a child comes home and tells the parent, you know what, this is what my teacher said, and they roll up their sleeves. They say, Chalo, let's go, come. We go, the small child is probably lying to you, they probably misquoted, misunderstood, you go in front of everyone to disrespect the teacher of your child, I promise you, the child will never learn anything. You know, to this day, and this is obviously for those who are studying Deen, there is a very important point I want to make regarding character and conduct even of the parents. Any child whose parents have come and attacked the Ustad of the child, I have never seen that child progress in deen. Never. Never. Not one. Up to, I still have to see one. If anyone, you know there is a Maulana teaching your child Alif and Ba. If you have ever had a bout with that Maulana, may Allah protect me and you. But in, in the cases that I have seen, almost all of them are dropouts after a certain period. Finished. They don't go far in deen. And then you have other parents who come and they say, you know what, consider this your child, I'm not getting involved. Yes, you, that is one way of doing things. But you can involve yourself. You should involve yourself as a parent. You should know what is going on. 
but you should do so in a very, very polite, dignified manner. If there is a problem, your child has been beaten and turned blue, you are allowed to raise it. Have a private meeting with the teacher and say, you know what, I really, really am concerned about the situation. That is how you talk. Another thing we are taught also as Muslims, when we are speaking, you don't have to disagree with opinions of others. To sacrifice your opinion for another opinion, which is permissible in Islam, is a very big act of worship. I said part of it last night when we were talking about husbands and wives. To sacrifice your opinion. Let me read the verse of the Quran where some of the Mufassirin have spoken about this. Very interesting. <laughs> you will never achieve true righteousness until you spend from that which you love most. When we read the verse, we think it's only connected to material items. Material items are in the verse. But what is included is your time. I love my time the most. Someone disturbs me, there's a problem. So to sacrifice your time, you will not achieve righteousness until you sacrifice time and effort to learn the religion. The time that you love the most, you want to spend it in every direction. Set aside that time imposing it on yourself to learn more of that which is positive and everything is positive in this religion and inshallah you will earn progress. Also, we love our opinions so much. Every one of us, what we think is right, everybody else is wrong. It's a fact. It's a human nature that our intellect leads us to think that I am right and the rest of the people are wrong. It's a human nature. So, we are taught through this verse that when you love something so much, if you sacrifice it, you will achieve righteousness on condition that that sacrifice is within the limits of Islam. Not like someone is saying, eat pork and don't eat pork and say, but brother, you know what, I'll eat it today because we were just told that you are allowed to sacrifice your opinion. That is now foolish behavior. That is now uh, intentionally misinterpreting what is being said. But for example, you want to do something one way, brother, we are going to candy, let's use this route. And someone else says, no, that's not a good route, let's use that route. Discuss it for one, two minutes, then one of the two must give up their opinion and love the opinion of the other and carry on. Then if something happens on the road, don't tell them, I told you, I told you. No, because then, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Once you've made your mind up, lay your trust in Allah. You've discussed it, I'm not saying don't discuss it, discuss it intellectually. You have a major issue, talk about it, speak about it. That is the character and conduct of a Muslim. Look how deep we get. So even your opinions, you need to know how to handle them. Most marital problems are connected to people thinking that now the wife is like Tyson and the, the husband is like Holyfield and they are fighting. They are fighting. And you know Tyson always loses. <laughs> so we need to understand that it's not a bout, it's not a fight, it's not a boxing bout. But at the same time, we need to talk about what we want and make it clear, listen to what the other wants, discuss it and accept the opposite opinion on merit, if you can do so, on merit. You know, one is democracy, but more important is meritocracy, which means we want that which is the best opinion, not necessarily that which everybody has said. That's quite a deep statement actually, but just take it at face value inshallah. So, as Muslims we need to learn how to talk, we need to learn how to walk, we need to learn how to interact with people, but it does not stop there. It continues very very far. The Prophet ﷺ speaks about the employer-employee relationship. Any business where the employer has satisfied his employees shall be granted blessings, barakah. If your workers are not happy with you, forget about blessings and barakah. We are not saying if your workers are happy with you, you will, grant, you will be granted a, a flourishing business. That may be part of the barakah, but whatever you earn will be full of blessings. Because the people working for you are making dua for you, they love you, they are really keen in meeting you every day. Yes sir, how are you? You know, and they know they can talk, they can shake hands, they can nod their heads. They are human beings, you sit and talk to them. Do you know what the hadith says about servants? Servants, those domestic servants. The hadith speaks about that and says, Ikhwanukum 
خولكم خول يعني الخدم إخوانكم خولكم جعلهم الله تحت أيديكم فمن كان أخوه تحت يده فليطعمه مما يأكل وليلبسه مما يلبس ولا تكلفوهم ما يغلبهم فإن كلفتموهم فأعينوهم بحديث of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم Those people who are working for you they are your brethren they are human beings they are sharing the same human nature as you they are also humans whomsoever Allah has placed under their hands some worker they should understand that they must treat that person in the same way they want to be treated they must clothe them with clothing similar to theirs at least one pair and they must grant them food similar to theirs what is the point every day you are having a big meal the cook himself is not allowed to touch that you throw the bones at them that's not fair they need to eat with you that is an Islamic teaching do not distinguish that is how Islam spread across the globe if you can't afford the whole meal for everyone at least give them a little portion of it the hadith says when you have neighbors who are not Muslims when you are cooking a stew add more water so you can give them tell them my Islam is teaching me to give you Allahu Akbar how many of us if we were to send it next door our relationship is so bad that they'll say hey there's all jadu in here there's all there's black magic in here just throw it away why because we swear them every day may Allah protect us we park our cars in front of their yards may Allah grant us understanding uh, sometimes out of human nature it can happen error then you rectify the error I'm not trying to attack those who may have done that tonight because your car is already taken by the police <laughs> So there's no point in me saying anything. <laughs> but it's an act of worship really to be considered as a Muslim. And why am I saying this? It is part of our topic. That's your character as a Muslim. You rather park one kilometer down the road than to disturb anyone else. And you will do that as an act of worship. Allah will grant you barakah and blessings. That is a true Muslim now. True Muslim. So you might not appear to be very religious, but your conduct is so high, the level of your social conduct is so high, you may be resurrected right next to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. People will be wondering, but that man, what is he trying to achieve? You know, he's sitting there. I wonder in the world, he didn't really even have anything. But only Allah knows, you know. And on that day, people will find out that it was good character and conduct. May Allah have mercy on us, really. So to be considerate, is something very very great i was mentioning the hadith let me complete it the hadith says that those who work underneath you meaning those who are below you those whom allah has placed under your authority in terms of work treat them how you would like to be treated tomorrow your children might be employed by them by their children it might be the other way around and that has happened so many people are rich today poor tomorrow and the generations when we say tomorrow we're talking about 30 40 years later sometimes times change that person might become rich. So many of us, we couldn't afford anything. But now, alhamdulillah, we've gone to a level where we can employ people. Sometimes we were employed. So when we were employed, how we did not like to be maltreated. Why don't we remember those days when we have employed others? And say, I will never be like that. Look, I want to give you an example. Sometimes we have young girls who come and say, you know, my mother-in-law is so terrible. So terrible. When my daughter gets married or when my son gets married, I will never treat my daughter-in-law like this. They make the statement. They take promises. Why? Because they might have momentary misunderstandings with their mothers-in-law. And I don't like the word in-law because I always say that law business, you know, law firms are involved and everything comes in. We don't like that. So, but then when they grow up, they forget all that and they now happen to be worse again. I don't know what is happening. One person came to me and told me that in fact, let me not say that because it might stamp on some people's feet. Connected to mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law. All people are good, but shaitan is bad. I want to repeat that again. All people are good, but shaitan is bad. So those who allow shaitan to get the better of them, the worst of them will remain. Meaning what is worse in them will stay behind. And those who, allow, who disallow shaitan from taking that which is good, then inshallah the good will remain. So it's up to us. We are all good people, inshallah. The hadith says, "Annasu ma'adina kama'adina al-dhahabi wal-fiddati, fakhiyaruhum fil jahiliyati, khiyaruhum fil islami, idha faquhu, aw idha faqihu." People are like mines of gold and silver. The best during the period of ignorance shall still be the best after they become good Muslims, if only they understand. Which means, when you have a mine, the amount of gold under the ground is the same amount. 
but it depends how much you mine, what effort you make to take it out. So what that means, in a nutshell, that is a big topic on its own. In a nutshell, every one of us has gold in us, but sometimes it is untapped gold. We have not allowed anyone to mine it, no one. So we have gold in us, but it's unmined. So people think we are bad people, yet we are not. We are good, but our gold is not mined. How is gold mined? Gold is mined with a big effort. You need earth moving equipment, you need uh, people to hit very hard, and you need to apply heat, intense heat and pressure, and precision pricking in order to create jewelry at the end. So the same with us. People will, you need to allow someone close to you to apply pressure on you, to apply intense heat on you, so to speak and to, to inform you things which your heart might not like to hear. Most of us, we don't like to hear the reality. Brother, you are very arrogant. Now, would you like to hear that? No, no one would like. They say, well, you are more arrogant than me, do you know? Because out of spite, we will answer back. No, we need to have someone who can tell us what's right and wrong, all of us. We need to have some form of a, some level of a person who is higher than us to try and correct us. This is why it's important to have a role model in Islam. And your role model needs to be someone you interact with on a daily basis. May Allah make the parents role models for their own children because those will be the most successful. How you talk, how you walk, how you breathe, how you interact in the house, your dealings and so on.